Okay, my name is Quaid Morris. Uh, I'm a, a assistant professor at the University of Toronto. My expertise is in computational biology, primarily in machine learning and statistics. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about analyzing gene lists, so doing enrichment analysis or overrepresentation analysis. And uh, I like it when people stop me with questions uh, if I'm unclear, so uh, don't hesitate to do that. Um, so uh, my computer crashed last night, which is why I wasn't here this morning, um, as these things always seem to happen That's when you need the most. It wasn't a side escape related problem. It was a, I have a Mac Air, and uh, their shelf life, 50% of their shelf life is about a year or two. And so I hit the year uh, limit. So apparently, I ate too much on my keyboard, too. But I don't think that's the problem. Oh, OK. OK, now I have this thing as well. All right. So just uh, here's the what kind of a motivation slide, examples of the sources of the gene list. You guys probably already know this because you have gene lists in your hands. Well, one way to get gene lists is you do some sort of uh, microarray profiling study. So here, uh, I guess what the, um, the, the relevant variable is time. Each one of these rows represents some sort of microarray. Uh, looks like a two-color array, and that's probably from yeast. And the genes are sorted uh, by the similarity to the adjacent genes. So this is just a cluster plot. And you grab particular parts of this cluster so that you have a cluster of genes in your gene list this way. Or uh, another way to do this, and this is from a, a, a co-IP study with, uh, in this case, it's Emilio, you, uh, you just run um, some sort of uh, differential expression analysis. In this case, this is uh, expression or presence in a, a, a fraction of co-IP with Emilio versus a, a mock co-IP fraction. And you can see here, red, red indicates uh, high expression is measured by microarray and Green indicates low expression or uh, black being absent expression. And you just get and you can sort by the difference between red and green. And this will also give you a gene list if you do some point to cut off at. And the only reason I wanted to show this plot is that one thing we're going to talk about is how to do enrichment analysis if you have a gene list. But another thing that's sort of uh, that's developing is that people will say, well, choosing this cutoff is a little bit problematic ultimately. And so what you might want to do instead is you might just want to capture this gene score. And this gene score here is um, it's full enrichment. And just use that gene score and be able to measure enrichment given a ranked list of genes. And I'm going to talk about one tool today to do that as well. Okay. And so what is an overrepresentation analysis in a uh, nut, uh, nutshell? So given a gene list or a set of gene scores and a set of gene annotations. So what I mean by gene annotations are just binary variables that have been associated with all the genes in your list. Meaning, uh, for example, does this gene have a particular transcription factor in its, in its promoter site, uh, in its promoter region? Does this gene associate with a particular functional annotation, like the gene ontology annotations that Gary just talked about? And so you can compare this gene list or these gene scores to these binary values, and you're going to ask whether or not if any of these gene annotations are surprisingly enriched in the gene list. And the details of this is how you assess surprisingly, and that's all statistics, and how you correct for repeating the test. Because when you're going to be testing for surprise, you want to find what annotations your gene lists are enriched are. And if you do a lot of tests, you have to correct for that fact. And I'm going to tell you about the major ways that people do that type of correction. OK, so here's my overview slide. And, and the sort of the theory, and for practice, we're going to have three labs. And the one that we're going to, it's going to be actually most uh, important that we're going to concentrate on is the lab number two, and that's going to come at the end, right? Where you're going to be analyzing your gene list for uh, gene ontology and enrichment, right? But I wanted to talk about a couple of these other labs, and we'll go through those as I go through the talk. So the fact that it's separated into uh, module and lab, where well, that's going to be a little bit flexible. So we have a little bit less lab time at the end, but we're going to have some labs embedded in the middle of the module. And now, as one of the things that Gary said, and I think is true. Is that, that, is that the tools for doing these types of analysis are still evolving. Right? So what's going to be most important for you to get out of this is the concepts that I'm going to talk to you about, because these concepts are going to appear in every single one of the tools that you're ever going to see. Right? And if you know the concepts, it, it's actually pretty easy to pick up the tools. Okay, but we'll show you specific tools that you can use. And they're just a subset of the tools that are available. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming by your presence in this room and the fact you've got this far, you know what a p-value is, and you know what the t-test is, 
right? I'm just going to go quickly over to review what those things are, but then assuming that's where you're starting from. And then we're going to start from those and say, well, why can't we use the, the t-test to do this over-enrichment analysis? And what are the right tests to use? And then how do we do this correction for doing multiple testing? And people have actually come up with two separate corrections, and we'll talk about both of them. Okay. So this is probably text you've seen in a, a statistics book before, but a, in a complicated way of saying it, the p-value is a bound on the probability that the so-called null hypothesis is true. And the null hypothesis is essentially saying that whatever it is that you're testing for, in this case enrichment, there's no enrichment there. So that there's the same distribution of annotation in the genes outside your list as the genes inside your list. And that's a very common null hypothesis. Right? And it's calculated by calculating statistics using your data. And you're, for testing the probability of observing these statistics for ones more extreme, given the sample of the same size distributed according to the null hypothesis. So by defining the null hypothesis, you're able to calculate this distribution on a statistic that you're going to measure in your data. And then ultimately, you're going to find out whether your, the statistic that you do uh, calculate is more extreme than one that you would if the null hypothesis were true. It's complicated, but intuitively, all it is, the p-value is the probability of a false positive result. And some people call this a type 1 error. Right? But that's just the summary. So if you do an enrichment test and you get some score, it's a probability, and you have calculated the p-value using that statistic, it's a probability that uh, the result of your enrichment test is a false positive. Okay. So here's the good old p-test. And then, so I'm assuming this is your background distribution. Right? So these are all the genes, say, in your genome, or these are all the genes that are on your microarray. And some of those genes are annotated in a particular category, and we call it the black category. And some of those genes are not annotated in the, uh, that category, and I call that the red category. And then how would you apply the good old t-test to this? Would you ask, OK, well, is the score that I assigned to the black genes, is, that, is the mean of that score significantly different from the mean of the score assigned to the red genes? Because I wanted to put the numbers inside of the balls, uh, I could only put numbers that were discrete values. So now we have a histogram that shows the distribution of those numbers on the black balls versus the red balls. Right? And everyone who's seen a t-test before, you know that these things, these curves have to be bell-shaped or approximately normal. And then once you do that, you can calculate a t-statistic which takes into consideration the number of black balls, the number of red balls, and the mean of the gene score on the black balls and standard deviation on the black balls, mean on the red balls, standard deviation. And there's this kind of complicated equation which will allow you to get the t-statistic. Right? And what, basically what it is is the difference between the means divided by some measure of the variation in the data. Right? And the question you're asking is, what's the probability of observing the t-statistic that you measure or one more extreme if the means of the two distributions were the same? Right? So. This here is a distribution of what the t statistic would be if given n and the number of black balls, and number of red balls, if the null distribution was true, meaning that they came from a distribution that had the same mean. Okay, now this should be review, but I'm happy to answer questions about doing a t test. Okay, so I mean, this is actually kind of a simple over enrichment analysis, right? This is saying if I have some annotations and I look at uh, some score, which might be a fold enrichment. Do I see higher full enrichment set A versus uh, higher full enrichment set B? Unfortunately, this test isn't appropriate for most of the types of uh, enrichment analysis that you need to do. Okay. But be comforted by the fact that you almost already know how to do enrichment analysis. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the bread and butter of the over enrichment analysis. What people use is called Fisher's exact test, and it's sometimes called the hypergeometric test or the hypergeometric p-value. Okay. And so here the idea is you drew away the gene scores. You have a, uh, a gene list, the set of genes that you've, you've decided are significantly enriched under the conditions that you're uh, that are um, regulated differently under the conditions that you're measuring. Right? And then you're looking at overlap. So say this is your gene list, and you say, and the question is, what is the probability that this selection that I took from the background population is one that I would see by random? And the way of asking that formally is what the probability of finding four or more black genes in a random sample of, uh, of five genes. And you can actually calculate that probability using something called a, the, um, well, 
using a hypergeometric distribution, you can calculate uh, if I were sampling randomly, how many of the sets that I came up with would have four black balls and one red ball. Right? And then to turn that into p-value, you say, okay, so here's the probability that if I were sampling randomly, I would get zero black balls. There's not many black keys here. Here's the probability I get one black ball, two black balls, three, four, five. And when you calculate this p-value, you just say, okay, what's the probability I got four or more black balls? Right? And then that p-value is just the sum of these probabilities. And I guess in this case, it's 4.6 times 10 to the minus 4. But that's what's going on ultimately when you're doing this enrichment analysis, right? And this is called the Fisher's exact test, right? And all I want you to understand is that's what's that's what's under the hood. Okay, any questions about that? This is the first time. Who's seen this before? Is this too fast? No. Okay. All right. So that's almost everything that you need to know about gene enrichment analysis. The rest are sort of details that these are things that, are, that sort of developed from this initial point of uh, Fisher's exact test. And Fisher's exact test is related to the chi-square distribution. And if you want to know how that is, I'll tell you about it after. OK. So here's some like random important details. So, so far, what we tested for was higher enrichment of black, so more black balls than what we would expect. If you want to uh, uh, test for more red balls than you expect, which would be an under enrichment of black, you test for over enrichment of red. So now here's, uh, I think, the most important thing on this slide is you have to choose the background population appropriately, right? So what I showed you before is there's just a big bucket that's got black and red balls. But it's, when you're doing this exact test, you have to know what, your back, what the possible, uh, what, that back pop, sorry, what that background population was. So for example, if you have a microarray and you're looking for differential expression under some conditions, and that microarray only queries 500 genes, well, your background population is that are those 500 genes, right? So your background population is things that could have been measured, that could have been on your gene list that weren't. And when you controlling for this background population is actually really important. So I've done work on like immune arrays that were uh, targeted towards genes that were important in the immune system. And of course, if you don't do the background population, any gene list that you choose from this immune array is enriched for genes with immune function. Right? You don't want to publish that and get someone to look carefully at your statistics and realize you made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake, but I could have. Okay. Okay. And then if you want to test for the enrichment of more than one independent type of annotation, so instead of black versus red, you ask, you know, is this ball circular or more square? Which I guess would make it not a ball. You, you just apply Fisher's exact test separately for each type. Right? And that's kind of obvious. OK, so what have we learned? And this is what we've learned. Let's skip this slide, because we're all pretty smart. OK, so just to get you warmed up, I'm going to show you something. This is uh, one of the first interfaces that will allow you to do uh, Fisher's exact tests. Now, there's some, um, and here's the, uh, here's the URL that will go to that website. So I'll just give you a chance to type in that URL, uh, and you probably have in your slides. So this thing was published about seven years ago. Okay, you actually have this in your in your book too. So go in the oven and get this thing out. Okay. Okay. What this is called is fun spec because it's fun. Uh, and fun spec has actually been uh, updated more recently than my slides were updated. So it was updated in September two thousand eight. So one of the problems with fun spec used to be that it was never updated. But now it's updated. So, and this is the easiest possible interface. So, if you are a yeast biologist, you're in a lot of luck, right? Because you just put in your gene list here, and there's only two different ways you can name yeast genes, more or less. You can use the common name, which is, uh, as Gary pointed out, it's also called the gene symbol, or you can use a systematic name, which de just depends on chromosomal location. And the systematic names all start with Y and end with W or C, indicating the Watson or Crick strand. Okay, and then Hopefully, they've actually already provided you with the gene list, uh, but we can copy and paste in, uh, another gene list in, and we're going to do that. And then you get to also click off all these annotation sources. So they've helpfully collected all together all the annotation sources. So here's the gene ontology, biological process, cellular component, molecular function. These, this is, yeah, these annotation sources, this is MIPS. So these were, this was a precursor to gene ontology. 
for gene annotation, but they're still going. Um, smart domains and PFAM domains, these are conserved domain protein domain sequences within the gene. There's just been analysis there. And then there's other ways of annotating the genes. And there's something down here that says bone for any correction, and we're going to talk about that later. Uh, you can say yes or no if you want. I would put no. And then you could just put your p-value cutoff. And once you submit the query, so let's just let me just show you how it is if it's uh, if it's not cached. I'm going to take like two of these genes out, one of the genes out. Okay, so now that's not going to be cached, right? But when you submit the query, it's pretty fast, right? So it's been it's tested in that time. Uh, enrichment in probably about a thousand different uh, categories of annotation. So someone asked me about whether or not you should use a binomial approximation to this Fisher's exact test. This is what you have to used to have to do before computers became fast. But now that they're pretty fast, you, you don't have to do that approximation anymore. And people calculate it exactly. Okay, so let's just start at the top. I've done that. We put in the gene list. And as the background population, what FunSpec assumes is it assumes the entire yeast genome is the background population. That's probably, that's another uh, limitation of FunSpec. You can't put a different background in, but there you go. Um, and let's go down. So this is MIPS. If we go down to the Go categories, they're going to fairly, oh, there we go. Looks like it hasn't got through the Go categories yet. OK, so let's look at the MIPS functional classifications instead. So here's just the category name, right? RNA degradation. This is the p-value that, that's been associated with it. And you see that there's a less than sign here. Um, that's something you'll see occasionally. What that means is the computer doesn't have the accuracy that it needs to calculate p-value smaller than that. Um, these are the genes that, over, uh, that were in the cluster. And these are f is the cluster size. And k was the number of genes that overlap between the gene lists you put in and in the cluster. And you can see it reports a bunch of different categories. Uh, and one of the problems here, which we'll talk about in a second, is that RNA processing, RNA degradation is actually a type of uh, ribosomal RNA processing in some ways, right? Uh, part of the ribosomal RNA processing is getting rid of the stuff that you don't need. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of overlap between these two categories. Okay. What did you say K1 is? Oh, K is the overlap between the gene set that you put in and the members of that category. Yeah. And F is the size of the category. These are parameters that you have to put into the hypergeometric p-value calculation. And what is the f? f is the size of that category. So there, in the MIPS functional classifications, there are 52 yeast genes that have been assigned the annotation uh, RNA degradation, meaning that they're involved in RNA degradation. And 11 were in the list. Yeah, 11 were in the list. How is the p-value calculated? Um, the p-value is calculated by saying, uh, if I were selecting randomly from the yeast genome, and I selected sets of size equal to the original size of the gene list, and I can't remember, how, oh, here we go. The original size of the gene list was 25. So in uh, random subsets of the yeast genome that contain 25 genes, what proportion of those random subsets have 11 or more genes from this category RNA degradation? You can see this actually a huge enrichment, right? So 11 divided by 25 is that's about 40 percent. So 40 percent of the genes in this list are annotated as being involved in RNA degradation, but only one percent of the genes in the yeast genome are, in, are less than one percent of the yeast genes in the yeast genome are involved in RNA degradation. So it's like a 40-fold enrichment in the list. It's an even bigger enrichment for our, our ribosomal RNA processing. So. All 25 of the genes in the original list are RNA pro uh, ribosomal RNA processing genes. Some of these software also give a z-score. Is that I'm not sure which software you're talking about. So one thing, one way that you so. Uh, Just address z-score. You want you want to know what a z-score is? Yeah, and this is important. <laughs> uh, it's it's a way of measuring enrichment. Sorry, uh, Wyatt, do you have an answer to that? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's only for yeast. This is, but this was just to get you warmed up for. 
if you're East Biologist, your, your day's done. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, most people aren't East Biologists. East is so easy. I don't know why everyone just doesn't work on it. Okay, but there you go. Okay, and then uh, while we were waiting, it actually found the time to uh, compute Go enrichment. And you can see the Go biological processes are very similar, right? So here's ribosome RNA processing, which was also MIPS category. All 25 genes in the list are involved, but Go has like twice as many genes uh, involved in ribosomal processing. It's because Go is a bit more advanced than MIPS. Okay, so that's fun spec. You can have fun with that. So if you Say anyone want to see me paste the gene list into the box? Because I can do that. That's <laughs> see, if you do that, you get different results. So uh, one, uh, one important thing that I want to show you, actually with this, so let's just look at this. So there's six different categories here that are, that are enriched. And you can see that these p-values are kind of high. So our cutoff is 0 0.01, and this p-value is pretty close to the cutoff, right? So uh, one thing that really determines significance is the size of your gene list, right? So if you have a larger gene list, as long as that gene list has the same proportion of genes that are, say, involved in uh, RNA uh, processing, um, your p-values are going to get much larger. And actually, the p-values are very uh, exponentially with uh, this number of genes in the gene list. So if I cut the number of genes in that gene list in half, I'm not changing the number of genes that are involved in our, our, our RNA processing, or but suddenly this the, the set of genes, uh, the set of, the categories that were significantly enriched goes from uh, from six down to two, right? And that's just the size of the gene list. And this is something that happens a lot in genomics: is people report these massive p-values or very small p-values, primarily because they have very large gene lists. But certainly the size of your gene list is, is what's going to give you significance or not significance, as long as the proportions don't change very much. Okay, any questions about... the gene list? How long is the gene list before it becomes like non-effective and all the gene your genome, right? Yeah. In the East case. Well, it's... more than 100 genes? Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah, about 100 genes. But again, but again, it's the proportion of your gene list more than anything else, right? So if you, t if, you if you take a gene list that's enriched for some category and you add 50 random genes, your p-values aren't going to go uh, your p-values aren't going to get better, they're going to get worse. Right? So you want to sort of trade off those two things. But if you have a gene list that only has three genes on it, even if that those three genes all have the same process, there it's not going to be significantly enriched for anything. Right? But the best thing is actually to move, use one of these methods that does gene ranking. Right? Cuz then that considers your whole gene list. And you don't have to choose this arbitrary cutoff. Okay, so back to the talk. And okay, so leads in nicely to uh, enrichment analysis with gene ranking, right? So. <coughs> Uh, it's just an overview of what I'm going to talk about. There's actually, oh my goodness, what happened to the slide? Um, so there's only three uh, things that you need to know about for enrichment analysis with gene ranking. So the first thing is why you can't use a t test. I can talk to you about that. But there's three tests that people use. One of them is called the Wilcox on Man Whitney test, or some people call it the Man Whitney test, or the Man Whitney Wilcox on test, or the Man Whitney U test, or the Wilcox on Rank Sum test. Um, but if you see any combination of the words Wilcox on Mann and Whitney, that's the test that they're using. I'm also going to talk to you about the Komogorov Smirnov test. People like to call it the KS test because it's easier to say. And then I'm going to talk to you about uh, GSEA, which is another gene ranking style test. Um, but it's primarily software driven rather than statistically driven. And we're going to show that, and we'll see that in a moment. So the Wilcox on Mann Whitney test, I'm going to explain, it's kind of a complicated looking test. But the thing that you really just need to remember is that the Will Cox on Man Whitney test is a t test on ranks. Right? So if you take all of your gene scores, and instead of the gene score, you replace the score with rank, and then do a t test, you'll get something very the answer you get is something very similar to the Will Cox on Man Whitney test, as long as you have a large enough positive and negative set. And the Komogorov Smirnov test, so 
The Wilcox on Matt Whitney test, because it's basically t tests on ranks, carries with it all the problems that you have when comparing distributions with t tests. Is you can only really ask the question: Is the is the set of genes that I've annotated are they larger or general smaller than the set of genes that don't have the annotation? Right. But if you're asking a more complicated question, like are the genes that have this annotation do they tend to have are, do they tend to be expressed more highly or more lowly, or do they tend to be expressed around the, uh, the, the zero distribution? Unless you do something fancy, you can't really ask that question with the Wilcox on Man Whitney test. But there's another test that will give you the answer to that question. It's the KS test. And the KS test asks, in general, are there distributions between the gene score distributions? Or, sorry, are there differences between the gene score distributions? Okay? And then GSEA is is a way, they call themselves like a Komogara Smirnoff test, but actually what they're doing is they're doing something similar to the Wilcox on Man Whitney. And we'll see that in a second. But anyways, those are the three tests that you'll see. I don't know any other tests that people, well, I probably, but they, that's, yeah. Okay, so everybody remembers the t-test, right? So here's the distribution of scores, the annotated genes, here's the distribution of scores, the unannotated genes. These are histograms instead of smooth distributions because I couldn't fit uh, numbers with more than one digit on the balls. <coughs> but in general, you might have smoother distributions, especially if you have, if you have a lot of genes. OK. And then the p-value is just the shaded area, right? Is the st statistic that I calculated more or less extreme than I would expect? OK. So why can't we just use that test? Well, I, there's this assumption that's implicit in the t-test in that these distributions are going to be, uh, the two distributions are bell-shaped. And there's lots of situations in which these distributions aren't going to be bell-shaped. So you want something that's a little robust to those sort of changes. Uh, the other problem is, as I said before, it tests for differences in the uh, means of the two distributions, but doesn't test for arbitrary dis differences between the distributions. Okay. And so, so here's one er instance in which the t-test probably won't give you the right result. So say you have a few outliers, and I've shown, so here's the black distribution, and you can see most of the mass of that distribution lies to the left of the red distribution, right? But there's this awful tail that goes way out here. Maybe you have a few outliers, like someone didn't take off the bad spots in your array, or something went weird with some of your genes, or for whatever reason you have this kind of long distribution here. You want to test for differences between those distributions, but because the t-test is based on means, and it's not robust to these sort of outliers, your means might actually end up being pretty close to each other. So you're not going to, uh, the t-test isn't going to report a dif dif distance difference. Now this is the test where, so in this case, um, your, your annotated, your set of annotated scores are more extreme than your, one, your unannotated one. And there's different ways of dealing with this. I mean, you could take the absolute value of full change, but really, it, 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 in sort of arbitrary cases, you can see distributions like that. And you want to be able to measure differences to say, okay, something different is going on here than it's going on here. That makes sense so far. Okay, and here's another one where the t-test is not really that fast. It doesn't really work that well. And so these are things where the gene scores are all positive, right? So let's say you have like sequencing data, or there you have counts, or you don't have fold enrichment or change in fold enrichment. So now you have two strictly positive distributions that have their mode at zero, but one of them's got a lot longer tail. So this is sort of biased towards this and, uh, rather than that. Now there's transformations you can do, but maybe it's just better just to use a test that uh, isn't sensitive to these sort of things. OK. And so I, I'm just going to talk for the next little while about the WMW test and the KS test, but for a GS, uh, for a GSEA, Anything where the WMW test is appropriate, GSEA is also appropriate. Okay. Oh, oh, the slide used to have. Okay, this slide used to have the answers, but I took those off. Okay, so here you can use either the KS test or the WMW test, right? Here you can only use the KS test because the WMW <coughs> test is basically asking if, if one distribution is to the right or to the left of the other, right? It's asking if there's a difference in means. You can't use that here. And then here you can either use KS or WMW. Okay, so what is this famous WMW, Man Whitney U, Wilcox on Man Whitney, um, Wilcox on Rank Sum test? And then the question is, as I said already, are the meanings of these two distributions significantly different? 
And it's really easy to calculate this stuff. So you take your gene scores. Oh, you can't see that, can you? You take your gene scores, and you sort them, in this case, from highest to lowest, right? And then you translate, once you've done that sort, you can translate the gene score into rank. And then all your computations are done on the ranks, the gene ranks. OK. And so here you calculate the rank sum, and then there's a complicated equation that gives you your statistic. And if you're doing the Man Whitney U test, this, te this statistic is called the U statistic. If you're doing the Wilcox sum rank sum test, this use this statistic is called the rank sum statistic. But really, they're just related by this like linear combination, this linear function. So that's why people call it the Wilcox sum Man Whitney test. And as I said before, here's kind of a complicated way of doing it. But really, what it ultimately ends up being is you calculate the ranks, and then you do a t test on the ranks. And that's going to work if your positive or uh, negative sets are sufficiently large. Right. So all this stuff is, I mean, I'm showing you all this stuff because I want you to sort of understand what's going on under the hood, but probably no one's ever going to ask you to do this. Right. OK. So yeah. Um, so for the describe method I told you, this t-test uh, t on ranks is only appropriate when the black and red sets are sufficiently large, and there's no tied scores. But most of this WMW software, so if you use R, uh, has what's called a tied rank correction and does the right thing when the sets are small enough. Okay, and it's robust to a few outliers. Okay, so that's the uh, WMW test. Any questions about that? <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to tell you what the Komogorov Smirnoff test. All right, KS test. So here's our, here's our probability distribution. This is like a histogram of gene scores where you separate the histogram into ones with the annotation, which I've called black, and ones without the annotation, which I've called red. You take this probability density and you make what's called a cumulative uh, distribution from that, right? And so here, I mean, the idea simply is this, is that any point in gene score on this plot is the sum of black is the proportion of black genes that have that score or less. So here the proportion of black genes that have that score or less are, is like 0.1. So we put 0.1 there. there. Right, so now the proportion of ones with uh, black score or less is a bit higher because we're, we're going up more. So now we're, say, at 0.2, even though the gene score hasn't improved that much. Anyways, you, you, you continue through this thing, the cumulative distributions of these probability density functions look something like this. Right? And then all the KS test asks is it asks what the largest difference is between these two cumulative distributions. Right? And so you can see that's going to work for sort of arbitrary distributions. And then that statistic is this, uh, that largest distance difference is the statistic that the KS test calculates. And then it's got some. Uh, if the null distribution is, oh, goodness. Okay, if the null distribution is true, then that statistic is a certain, uh, sorry, if the null hypothesis is true, that statistic has a certain distribution. You can assign it a p-value, and that's your KS test. Okay. So this is why you don't use these two tests for everything. Neither test is as sensitive to the t-test. What that means is, if, if there are real differences, and the t-test is the appropriate test to use, um, these tests will less, uh, are less likely to detect those real differences in the t-test. So they're going to have more false negatives. right? Um, they can also give you different answers, right? because WMW detects difference of medians, KS detects difference of distribution. But in that case, you probably want the answer the KS test to give you. OK. OK, and then here's the slide that I thought the other one was. So if you have something like this, WMW or KS is appropriate. Here, KS is appropriate. Here, WMW or KS is appropriate. Most of the time, I use the WMW test. OK, so anytime you see these things, now you know what's going, uh, what people are doing. OK, so five years ago, sorry, four years ago now, uh, this paper was published describing GSEX, uh, which was really 
uh, is a new way of doing exactly the same thing that the WMW uh, test does. But what's nice about GSCA is there's a really nice software package that goes along with it. And it solves many of the problems that you need to solve when you do the WMW test. And so let me tell you how this works. So here is your, let's say you're doing some sort of, uh, in this case, uh, let's say you're doing a microarray study. And you have a rank, you have a uh, list of genes. And in this case, you've done 20 different uh, experiments. And these are uh, divided into two phenotype classes. So say this is some mutant, and then this is the wild type. Right? Uh, and then you, know, you can make a cluster gram as per usual. Or in this case, what they've done is they've ranked the genes by how well they're correlated to these phenotype classes. So what I mean by that, what I mean is, is things that are high in A and low in B are at the top of the list, and things that are low in B and high, sorry, low in A and high in B are at the bottom of the list. Right, and then this is the score, is the correlation with the phenotype. Okay, and then you can rank it by these scores. And then now, what you do with this ranked gene list, which is scored, is you compare it to a gene set, which I've been calling gene annotation. So here are all the lines indicate genes that have the given annotation. So let's say these are all genes um, that are involved in uh, ribosomal processing. Okay. So then now what GSA does is they make this really nice figure. And the way the figure works is that as you go from things that are highly correlated with the phenotype to things that are highly negatively correlated from the with the phenotype, every time that you see a gene in the gene set, you go up a little bit so that there's a, a slight enrichment, and every time you see something that's not in the gene set, you go down a little bit. Right? And then you just make this plot. You know, it's going up, and then you go down. And so what they calculate is they calculate the maximum deviation from zero in this enrichment. So if you're seeing a random walk, you would go up, you'd go down, go up, and go down. So if there were no enrichment in the gene, in the gene set, they would be sort of evenly distributed throughout this ranking. Right? So you shouldn't be able to go up that much before you came back down. Okay? And so the statistic that they use is the maximum deviation from zero, with the, which would they call this enrichment score. Okay, so for the WMW test and the KS test, we know what the, uh, so in the, we know what the correct distribution is to use for the null hypothesis. Here they don't know what the correct distribution is to use, but there's a trick that you can use. There's a trick that you can always use in statistics. If you don't know how to assess the distribution of the statistic when the null hypothesis is true, you can just generate a lot of cases where the null hypothesis is true, look at the value of that statistic, and then generate an empirical distribution. Right? So if the question you're asking is, is this ES score significantly different from random, you just create a whole bunch of random sets, measure this ES score, and see what the, uh, what the highest ES scores you get, or like the top 5% of the ES scores. And this is exactly what they do, is that they take these, uh, this phenotype and then they sort of randomly distribute it so that they take these genes and they, uh, these uh, samples and they randomly permute it, calculate the maximum ES score that they see, and, they, and then the p-value that they assign to the ES score is the proportion of time in random samples that you get an ES score higher than the one you measured when everything was correctly ordered. It's just a trick that's used to calculate the p-value. But ultimately what it's asking is, are there more things at the, uh, in the gene set at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list? Which is exactly the same question the WMW answers. Okay, so one other thing that I want to say is that uh, this ES score, wherever it reaches the maximum, they call this the leading edge subset. These are things that, these are, the genes in this set are ones that have, that appear before you get to this highest enrichment level. So this, they, they call this a sort of an obvious cutoff. Okay. Okay, so what have we learned so far? The TS, TS test, uh, T, T test not valid when one or both of the score distributions is not normal. So all you need is a robust test to <coughs> test for difference of medians. You can use either the WMW or uh, GSEA. In this case, they're interchangeable. 
uh, to test for uh, overall difference between the two distributions, use the KS test. Okay. And there's other common uh, tests and distributions that people have used. And then I, you, know, you might encounter binomial chi-squared. And I've just put notes down here, but I'm not going to talk about them. OK. So now we're going to skip over lab two, because we're going to come back to it. And we use lab three, three which is using uh, GSEA to evaluate rank list. OK. OK, so this is the, um, uh, this is the website from which you can get the, uh, you can download GSCA. But what we're actually going to do is we're going to run GSCA as a Java web start. Okay, now, in, actually, in order to use uh, this software, you're going to have to register. But the registration process is not um, that hard. You have to give them your email address and your name. If everyone's okay with that, uh, you can just go ahead and do that right now. Uh, if not, uh, you can use my email address. I'm not sure if you can use m multiple multiple people with my e email address can do it at once, but um. okay, good. All right. I'm glad that I asked for you to install it, and I'm too bad that I forgot that I asked to do you do that. Okay. You ready to go? Did you also install the uh, the sample data sets? Okay, all right, good. <laughs> all right. Okay, open it up. You should see something that looks like this. Yeah. Now, you probably don't have these data sets, so I'm going to show you how to get them right now. Okay. Here's the website that you want to go to. It's also on the wiki. Can, you, can everyone see that up there? Is there anyone who can't see that? So, I don't know if you've gone through the tutorial, but we're just going to download the data set suggested by the tutorial. So, this first data set here is uh, microarray data. P53HGU. And just download that and save it. Okay. Uh, save it. Well, just remember where you save it, because when you open up GSEA, it'll you'll have to browse to get the data set. But, yeah, that would be a good place. Sometimes you don't have control over that. Yeah, p53 underscore hgu 95 ab dot gct. So the dot gct just indicates that it's one of these a GSEA specific data formats. But it's not a very complicated data format. And I've just opened up the text file so you can see what the file that you are downloading actually looks like. I just opened it up in Notepad. That's it. Yeah. I think you make it, you want to make your own data. Um, well, typically, 
if you want to do that, you don't even have a file that looks a lot like this. Okay, so the columns correspond to different samples, right? So, and the numbers are expression levels. And the rows correspond, in this case, to AFI probes, but yeah, they can also correspond to gene names. All right, but the file format requires three, uh, two things at this top of the file. Right, it requires you to have. This is the. This is the number in this case probes or a number of. Uh, if it's not probes, genes, and then this is the number of samples that you have. Right. And then here, these are just the, these are just the descriptions of the samples. This is the gene name, and so the gene description, they've actually not put any gene descriptions in. You can see this NA, but then these are all the numbers that associate with it. It has to be tab-limited text. So, Okay. So there's one other file that you need. Oh. And I'll write it up on the board here. It's the third one. P53.CLS. Uh, okay, I've lost my internet. P53.CLS is the third one in that list. Okay, so I'm just going to open it up to so you can see what it looks like. Yeah, you just load it. You, just, I, you should save it on your desktop. I've just opened it up for people who want to see what the format of this file is. But this file, all it tells you is if you uh, go back to the slide, there's this phenotype that we are lo uh, looking for a correlation with in order to rank the genes. You have to provide GSEA information about what that phenotype is. So in this case, some of these samples are classified as mutant, and some of the samples are ca classified as wild type. <coughs> and so what there is in this file is, again, you're saying how many samples you have, which is 50, and how many different um, phenotypes there are and then how many rows there are. So here the samples have been classified as, so we've got 50 of these text labels and they're classified as either mutant or wild type. Um, okay. Now, you should be in download data. Now I've already preloaded it, but we're going to redo it again. So browse for files. Yeah, so this is from the software. It's from the software, yeah. So press browse for files. And you want to load in these two files that you just downloaded. Yeah, you gotta press load data and and then press browse for files. So I'm just gonna move around so see I brought load data there. And then I press browse for files. And you want you need to open both of these files. The dot GCT, which is your microarray data, and the dot CLS, which is your, your phenotype classification.
Okay. I've actually done all the hard work, so I'm going to. Um, <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the beginning. And kill this and relaunch. No, I'm just doing it because it's I've, I've made it too easy. <laughs> so this is what the uh, this is what the screen should look like when you press Run GSEA. Okay, so the expression data set that you want is the one that you previously loaded. Okay, I have to actually reload the data. It looks like. And I'll just do that quickly. Okay. So now you have a bunch of required fields. You need to put the expression data set in and the gene sets data set. So these are the files that specify the annotation. And this is why a lot of this is one of the main reasons people use GSEA so much is because they have very extensive uh, gene set database. Uh, okay, so number of permutations, I'm going to tell you about a second. You actually want to set that to five. And the phenotype labels is the file that you downloaded that has the CLS thing. This tells you what phenotypes to use. Okay, so now this is collapse data set to gene symbols. This is just saying that this is doing this identifier mapping that Gary talked about previously. So the expression data set that we downloaded, all the, um, all the identifiers of the probes were AFI identifiers. But in gene sets, you, you tend to have uh, gene sets associated with gene names. So what collapse data set to gene symbols does is it takes whatever probes or however you specify your genes and it translates them into gene symbols. And they say collapse because, in, in particular in this AFI array, there's actually multiple probes for some of the genes. So if you have multiple probes for some genes, you do the averaging. And then the chip platform tells you, tells you how to collapse the data set to gene symbols. And the permutation type, you're just going to leave the phenotype. So I'm going to fill in these fields. So the expression data set should be pretty easy because you've already loaded it up and you only have one choice. Right? So it says there's 12,000 different probes, uh, 50 different samples, and I guess, I don't know what chip NA means. Okay, so now for the genus, uh, gene set, we're just going to follow what the tutorial told us to do, and so... If you don't mind, yeah. when you looked at the text file of the... I know that you said it, but I might not have heard. Uh, the different rows were not log two transforms, they were just raw values? They were raw values, yeah. Okay, they're not transformed. Right? They can be transformed, though. They can be? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's no problem with them being transformed. Okay. All you need is the probe set and the log transform expression values. Yes. And you don't really need this description name, like... No, it didn't look like they used description at all. Yeah. But, but I, it, a column probably needs to be there oh, to satisfy the formatting. But what you can do is, you can, if you have Excel, you can just copy the gene names Make an extra column. Make an extra column, <laughs> put in some rubbish, yeah, and call it descriptions. Okay, uh, but what you want to make sure is you don't put any spaces in there. Sometimes spaces confuse it. So NA would be perfect. Yeah, the NA is fine. Yeah. Okay, so here is a list of the gene set databases. So uh, some of the things, there's KEG is included here. Um, Go is included at some point. I guess MIR uh, corresponds to uh, microRNAs. We're going to use a very simple one. We're going to use the top one in the list, the C1 dot. And this just classifies genes by their chromosomal location. Okay? The first one. So the gene sets are actually chromosomes, which is important, say, if you're looking for differences in. Um, um, uh, gene copy number in different cancers, right? Is that the best one to use for everything, or just you're using it for this particular data set? I'm using it for this particular data set. You can see descriptions if you want. 
you go to the molecular signatures database on the GSEA uh, website. And here they talk about all the different uh, curated gene sets. So like I said, what we're using is the chromosomal ones, right? And so there's a whole bunch of different gene sets that they've curated. So you can actually select the gene set that you want to look at based on what you're interested in. Okay, so GSEA takes a long time to run, right? And remember I told you use these permutations in order to be able to assign p-values to things. So the more permutations you give it, the more accurate your p-value estimates are going to be. But unfortunately, because it takes a long time to run, we don't want to sit around and wait for a long time, so we're going to put 5 in instead of 1,000. It's still going to take about 5 minutes. Okay. Now for the phenotype labels, I guess you all only have one choice here, but this is the source file of the phenotype labels. And then here you're going to ask oh, to be what, what comparison you want to do. Well, in this case, we only have two different phenotypes, wild type versus mutant. So there's actually only one comparison we can do, but we can make it go both ways. Okay. So you can choose multiple by doing control? <laughs> Let's find out. Nope. Yeah, there you go. Only one at a time. The result that it gives you, it doesn't really incorporate multiple phenotypes, right? You get to get that one enrichment plot. Okay. And so now for the chip platform, because we've asked it to class the data set the gene uh, symbols, GSEA has to know how to do that. So you have to tell it what chip platform that your microarray data is from. So here, this is the P53 study on this chip platform. That's how they've named this data set. So I guess this is actually an easy way to locate the chip platform. It's this one right here. HG underscore U95 AB2 dot chip. Yeah. And if you haven't found it yet, you just look at this, right? It's a raw chip data that is built So now you can show workflow. Now you press run. Right down there. Okay, and this is going to take about five minutes. But you can see it's telling you down here what it's doing. And so this here tells you the status. So if it comes up, if it comes across any problem, this is going to say error. Okay. Has anybody has anyone got running? Yeah. Okay. Has anybody got error? If you're getting the error that the gene set sizes are too small, that seems to suggest that what's happening is that when it's trying to do the collapse, it's not collapsing appropriately, right? So it's not getting the mappings from the probes to the gene names appropriately. So they have helpfully provided on the website a collapsed version of the file. And so that's what the second one is, uh, p53 underscore collapsed. So I'm just going to save that to my uh, wherever it is that stuff saves. And then I'm going to open up with Notepad to show you what the difference is with this file. Don't open it with Notepad yourself because it seems that Notepad might mess your file name up. But now, all the probe names, or most of the probe names, have been replaced with gene symbols. Okay, so now let's go back to load data. Browse your files and get the collapse symbols instead. So once once you have the collapse symbol file, you can use that as your microarray data instead. And now because you no longer need to collapse the symbols, you can put false.
Why would it work for some people and not for uh, I think it might be Vista. Because <laughs> everybody who has problems had Vista, I think. You have Vista, right? I have Vista. Okay, I have absolutely no idea why it doesn't work for some people. <laughs> you have this 10 years worked? Yeah. Oh, that's because of your permutation. Oh, it's random. Oh. So you had different permutations than they did. Yeah. Okay. So the, the the permutations. This is uh, this is how they are assessing significance, okay. right? And so if you have a lot of permutations, you're bound to get the same answers. But if you have a small number of permutations, it's sort of randomly decided. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I don't know why it's not working for some people. So in, the, no, I in, in normal, when you do your own data set, basically what, you're not, what we are going to get is that gmt dot gmt file, right? No, no, sorry, the first one. This, this, this very much depends upon what microarray you're using. Yeah, so, so if you suppose you're using the human genome, you want to see plus two. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then, in in that case, you put your data in. You might have to update the. You have to, you put your spreadsheet in. Spreadsheet would then now that it would correspond to the absolutely raw data with the raw expression values. Yeah. You, you, you could use the raw expression values. Yeah. So you, the first column would be uh, your uh, gene ID, process yeah. ID. Yeah. Second column would be the description, and the rest would be all the raw expression values, either log transform or not log transform, yes. depending upon whether you've done the RNA, GCRNA, or not done, not done. Yeah, and that's kind of up to you. Okay, and then that it'll give you different answers, but it should give you primarily similar answers. So that is the one you're going to load in the first expression data set. Yeah. The gene sets database would be. The gene sets database, well, you have to decide which one you want to use. From the GDSPA. Yeah, if you go to the website. website. Okay. Yeah. And then the permutation is fine. The phenotype labels are something that you would choose. That's something you specify, yeah. You specify. And then you can collapse it. And permutation type, again, you could yeah. choose. So you want to use phenotype for your permutation type. It's on the website. Yes. You need to have the gene symbols match the genes the gene symbols using the gene sets. Yeah. 
But what you you but you've designed your own microarrays, right? Right. If I have a custom, for example, a custom microarray for that metrics, right? And then I have to read these files in. I got from them. Yeah. So I'm not actually sure how to update the database. But one thing that you can do is that you can translate from the probe name into gene symbols. Right, and so that's that's what's being done. That's what's done right here, is uh, the fix I made for people who are having problems downloading the chip platform. So in this case, these are class symbols, and then those are just the gene symbols themselves. So the primary problem that uh, that you have is mapping between the gene symbols or the gene identifiers that are used in the gene sets database and the gene identifiers in your microarray data. So, but if you can do that mapping yourself, say using um, Synergizer, which Gary's going to show you shortly, there's no reason you can't use GSCA. So, it does make a little bit of difference. Because it's calculating the correlation in order to rank the genes. So if you use fold enrichment or log fold enrichment, that's going to change the outcome of the correlation. And in some cases, it might change the gene ranking. There's, there's a way to pre rank. There's a pre rank of the genes. So is, is that advanced fields, Gary? Yeah, it's in tools. If you rank your genes outside of GSCA, and you don't want GSCA to rank them, you better do a ranking system and just pre rank them. Yeah. It also depends on how your genes are. Yeah. It's a Okay, so these are the pre-rank uh, pre plots, and these are exactly the same plots that I went over in the slides. <coughs> oh, okay, sorry. This is very easy to do. You just press, assume you get success. You press on success. And I went to the snapshot of enrichment results. Here are the plots. So this is for a specific gene set. This gene set is called chromosome 11 Q13, which is just a chromosome location. These black bars correspond to genes in that location. And this is the enrichment score plot. Right? And this is the maximum enrichment, and that's been what's been used to assign the p-value. And the p-value they assign is 0, which means it's probably less than 10 to the 16th. Probably less than? It's probably less than 10 to the 16. So, but it might be. Just let me have a quick look. No, okay. Sorry, this is an. I'm wrong. It's an empirical p value. Okay, so I got the figures by going to snapshot enrichment results. I, I got this table by going to detailed enrichment results. Okay, so the thing about these p values is, is what, what the lowest that um, the p values are, as I mentioned before, are calculated by calculating the proportion of times. The ES that you observe using the data, uh, um, ordered according to the phenotype, 
how often that ES is larger than the ES you get when you permute the phenotype assignment to the samples. So can we uh, have a coffee break and come back to this <laughs> at, at, during the next lab? Because I, now I want to tell you what the FDR is, which is something that you've seen, and the family-wise error rate, right? Yeah, I and, and, then, and then in, <laughs> in the following lab, we're actually going to analyze the gene list. So uh, what? Yeah, we're going to have a coffee break. And if you go back to the snapshot of the gene, well, the problem is that you've only did five permutations, which means that your p-values can only be of one of five different levels. Uh, so how many permutations should you be doing? 1,000. 1,000. Actually, I would recommend doing as many permutations as you're willing to do. So if you could run this thing overnight, you could do 10,000. So really? Is Why should it? So then how is it possible that the people who sell these as a package with money? This is free. No, I, oh, that's why it's a lot. <laughs> is that what you say? It, this oh, is totally free. I know. But I'm getting both packages which are which we can buy with money and do the same thing. They are running in ten minutes they do the same thing, right? They're probably doing Fisher's exact test. But they do it. They give F W E R and F D R. Yeah. I'm gonna show you I'm gonna show you a free package that does that in five minutes. Okay. Okay? That's what we want to know. Okay. <laughs> But people are increasingly using this package. No, so it's, it's good to know what's going on here. Yeah. Just, I don't understand how so. <laughs> uh, You're not alone in that. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, why don't we have a 20-minute coffee break? And if you want, you can set it up to run 1,000 permutations or 5,000 permutations, because we're not going to get back to this for about an hour. Okay, I'm going to go back to the lecture. I'm going to tell you about correcting for multiple testing, and then we'll come back to the lab. Hi, everybody. Okay, we're back. All right, so we talked about Fisher's exact test, and those of you with gene lists and only gene lists, that was what was most relevant to you. We also talked about enrichment analysis with gene rankings. So some people have full enrichment or some way of scoring their genes, and that was what was relevant to you. And then we looked at GSDA. So if you have a lot of microarray data, or a lot of features for microarrays, or you just have a way of doing gene ranking, the GSCA is the tool for you. And one thing that I should have mentioned that I didn't mention is what we used GSCA in was in the default mode, where GSCA is actually calculating the ranking based on the phenotypic classes that you give it. But there's other modes that you can use where you supply it with the gene ranking, or you supply it with fold enrichment, or you simply supply it with two different microarray experiments and ask it to calculate fold enrichment. And if you look closely at the options, you'll be able to detect those different ways of communicating with GSCA as well. But at the end of the day, the GSCA is just really a way of taking gene rankings and transforming them into, uh, into enrichment. Okay, but now we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, the last part is correcting for multiple testing. Now, you've seen this, these corrections in both of the labs so far, but I haven't really said too much about it. But the, the big problem is, is that when you're looking for enrichment or you're doing an enrichment analysis, you're going to be asking for enrichment in a lot of different gene sets. Right? And if you do this again and again and again, you're eventually going to win something called the p-value lottery. And so we have to correct for the fact that you can do this. And there's two corrections that people use uh, in genomics. There's a correction for family-wise error rate, and there's a correction for false discovery rate. And I'm going to explain what those two things are in this next part of the module. Who's seen uh, FDR before? Okay, so everybody, about half of you have seen FDR. Does everybody know what it, be, uh, what it stands for? <laughs> All right. 
it's, <laughs> it's good to know that everyone can read. All right. So and then we don't really need to go through this slide, right? <laughs> the point is, is that if you have a false positive rate of five percent, and then you do twenty tests, you expect one of those tests to be a false positive. Right? So if you're testing for enrichment in a thousand different gene categories, you get a p-value of 0.01, you'll probably get 10 tests that are going to give you a p-value of 0.01. Right? We need to correct for that. And there's two ways to correct for that. One is a very easy way of correcting for that. And that's called doing, uh, so let me just tell you what the corrections are first. One is correcting for the family-wise error rate. Right? And th this controls the probability that any one of the tests is a false positive. It's really stringent. So if you do a thousand tests and you get p-values for each of those, and you correct those p-values for family-wise error rate, and you get a final p-value of p0.01, then there's only a one percent chance, or at most a one percent chance, that any one of those thousand tests is a false positive. So it's a very, very stringent correction, right? But it actually turns out to be too stringent sometimes, and sometimes people are willing to accept what's called the false discovery rate. And this controls the proportion of tests that um, are false positives. Right? So if you do a thousand tests and you get an app false discovery rate of one percent, that means that you wouldn't on average you wouldn't expect more than ten of your tests to be false positive. Ten of your successful tests. Sorry, so let me rephrase that. If you do a thousand tests and ten of them are deemed to be uh, you, you find ten tests to be true or ten uh, significantly enriched categories at a false discovery rate of 0.01, then you would expect on average only 0.1 of the 10 tests to be false. So 100 tests, you expect one of the tests to be false. And it turns out that this false discovery rate is a much less stringent test, stringent threshold in some conditions. Okay. So there are a couple ways to, correct, to control family-wise error rate, but the most common way that people use, and the easiest way, is something called the Bonfroni correction. Has everyone seen the Bonfroni correction before? Right? You just take your p-value and you multiply it by the number of tests that you've done. Seems totally reasonable. Okay. And if you do that, then this is a this is a bound on the probability that any of the one test is a false positive. Okay. So what you can do instead, as I said, is you use the false discovery rate. And what the false discovery is, so the false discovery rate is starts off being similar to the Bonfroni correction for the for the first test. What you do is you take all the tests, you take all the p-values, and you rank them from lowest to highest. And then you step down this list, and then you compare the p-value to something called the Q value. So at the top of the list, but the Q value uh, sorted it the wrong way. Okay, so th this is sorted from top to bottom. So this is this is what I was actually talking about. So say you've done 100 tests, right? And so your Q value here, uh, is, so the bone for correction for 100 tests would be taking your P value and multiplying it by 100, or in this case, is taking your P value dividing uh, the Q value dividing by 100 and comparing that to your P value. Okay. Does that make sense? So what I so the Bonfroni correction says you take all your p-values and you multiply it by the number of tests, right? So say you've done 100 tests and your smallest p-value is 0.01. The Bonfroni correction says that your smallest p-value has now become one. Okay, which is kind of a weird p-value, but that's what happens. Okay, so what? So what you can do instead is you can say, okay, I'm going to compare my p-values to this threshold, 0.05, right? So you want the p-value to be less than 0.05. The other way, so in the, after you do the bone froni correction, instead of multiplying the p-values by 100, you change your threshold. So instead, you compare to 0.05 divided by 100. Okay, and that's another way of doing the bone froni correction. Okay, so that's equal to saying 0.05 times 0.01, right? Okay, so that's what's going on with this slide. So down here, we're comparing the smallest p-value to a threshold that keeps increasing as the p-values get larger. 
So the smallest p-value is compared to the threshold of 0.05 times 0.01. So this is the bone only correction if you have 100 tests. Right? And then, as you, and then the second p-value you compare to 0.05 times 2 divided by 100. And the third p-value you compare to 0.05 times 3 divided by 100. So that the, the threshold that you're comparing against increases as you go up the list. Right? And so the threat this um, you continue going up the list until you find a p-value that satisfies your original uh, the original thing that you're testing against 0.05 times the um, I guess 100 minus uh, one uh, minus the rank plus one divided by 100. So in that case, that's 97, right? 0.97. So this threshold is greater than this p-value. So this actually becomes our false discovery rate threshold. And so the false discovery rate, if we are able to find a p-value less than this test, is 0.05. And the corresponding q-value is 0.05 times 0.97. That slide is a lot worse than I thought it was. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to do it on the board, okay? Who understood that explanation? This is a very funky thing. So is this deep ground in statistical theory, or is this a heuristic that somebody found in the books? Uh, this is deeply grounded in statistical theory. I'm just telling you how to do it. So what, what we're doing right here is called the benjamini hochberg procedure. Right? And then if you perform this procedure, which I'm going to do a better job of explaining in a second, you're controlling something called the false discovery rate. So you're controlling what's known as, a, you're controlling a bound on the expected number of false positives in, of the tests that you deem to be, uh, of all the tests that you deem to have been successful. So if you do a test on 10,000 different gene, uh, gene sets and you find that 100 are significantly enriched and you bound the false positive rate at 5%, then you would expect, on average, no more than five of the tests would be false positives. Okay, but then that's, so the false discovery is a bound on the expected number expected proportion of the tests that are false positives. Okay, I've said that in kind of a complicated way because I wanted to be clear about what it is, but this procedure, the benjamini hochberg procedure, guarantees this bound works under the condition that either all your tests are independent or your tests are positively correlated with each other. Uh, for the most part, so but when you're doing gene set analysis, um, you tend to fall in the condition that your tests are positively correlated with each other. So people forget about this condition. But nonetheless, this is the procedure that everybody uses. OK, and so let me describe it for you on the board, because the slide was awfully confusing. OK, so you take your 10,000 categories. You calculate your p-value for all of them. And we're going to use Fisher's exact test, because we're going to compare the overlap of your gene set to the category itself. right? And then Fisher's exact test is going to give us a p-value for each one of those 10,000 tests. We take all those p-values and we're going to sort them from smallest to largest, right? So let's come up with some like good p-values here. So if I did 1,000 tests, I'd expect to get a good p-value, a p-value of like two to the minus 10, uh, two to the times 10 to the minus five. So 0 0.00002. And then the next, large, the next largest p-value, let's say, is this. And then so on, so on, so on. At some point, I'm going to get to some awful p-values that probably are never going to be significant. And say, OK, so say that's one. And now we've got, this is the test, this is the rank here. Can people, can you see this? Not uh, if I write in black, you can do it. Okay. Maybe I could take this off the board. No. Okay. You won't be allowed back in here. No. Q 
Okay, so here's the rank. Here's the p-value. And TSCA calls this the nominal p-value, which is a good enough name, and I'll use that. And let's say our, our highest p, our lowest p-value is like 2 times 10 to the minus 5. Our second lowest p-value is 3 times 10 to the minus 5. And I'm just going to do etc. And then we're going to get down to the bottom of the list. And at the bottom of the list, we have very high p-values. And the highest p-value we're ever going to get is 1, or highest nominal p-value. OK. So if we were doing the bone for only correction, <laughs> All right. I don't know why I've made slides when I have whiteboards. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is the nom These are the nominal p-values. Can everybody see this now? Uh, can anyone read my writing? <laughs> okay. Here's the rank. Remember, we did 10,000 tests. Here's the nominal p-value. So it goes from two times ten to the minus five all the way up to one. And then. Here is the threshold. <coughs> this is the p-value threshold that we're testing against. And I'm going to come up with something called the q-value threshold. OK. Now, as I said before, if you want to correct for multiple tests using the Bonferroni correction, you have to, uh, before you compare it to your threshold, you have to multiply the p-value by the number of tests that you do. Okay, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to divide the threshold by the number of tests that I did. Right, so I'm going to take my p-value threshold, which is 0.05, that's the standard one that people use, and then I'm going to divide by 10,000, because that's the number of tests that I did, and then I'm going to ask the question, is this p-value smaller than that? Okay. And 0.05 divided by 10,000 is going to be 5 times 10 to the minus 6, right? So the answer to my question is no. This p-value is not significant. <coughs> after the Bonferroni correction. In fact, none of these p-values are going to be significant because this is actually the lowest p-value. Okay. So now for the q-value threshold, what we're going to ask is we're going to control instead of the family-wise error rate, we're going to control the false discovery rate at 5%. Now there, when we're, ca when we're testing this threshold, we're going to tr uh, do this original threshold And then we're going to multiply it by the rank of the p-value. So this is like a p-value threshold. You're never going to be able to read this, but times rank. OK? So now this, so the test we do here is 10 to, uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 6. The test we do here is 1 times 10 to the minus 5, right? Because we multiplied 5 by 2. The test we do here is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5, and then we do 2 times 10 to the minus 5. So you can see that this p-value threshold increases as we go down the list. And now at the bottom, it's going to be 5 times 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the 4. So we're going to get back to our normal p-value threshold, which is 0.05. Right, so that, now the advantage of doing this is let's say that these nominal p-values are all going to be kind of similar to each other. So this is like 3.1 times 10 to the minus 5, 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5. So now when we get down to like the rank 3,000 p-value, we're still not that high, right? Say now we're only at 4. Let's, let me choose a number that's going to come out more nicely. I'm going to say that rank 2,000. So now we're at point, uh, 4.0 times 10 to the minus 5. Right? So we got kind of lucky with all these p-values. We've got a whole <laughs> bunch of p-values that are all sort of similar to each other. So now the q-value threshold that we compare against is, five, is 
are our bone Ferroni corrected threshold multiplied by the rank. So, but in this case, the rank is actually 2,000. So this makes this number very high, right? This makes this number 10,000 times 10 to the minus 6, which 10,000 times 10 to the minus 6 is 10 to the 4 times is 6, 10 to the uh, 4 minus 6, so it's 10 to the minus 2. So this new Q value threshold is actually 0.1 which is higher than the nominal p-value. Right? And now, suddenly our, our luck ran out and our p-values are like 10 to the minus 2 at 2001. Right? And then all of them are going to be larger than 10 to the minus 2. So now we cut our threshold here. So our new p-value threshold is actually uh, 0.1. So, sorry, uh, let me be more clear about this. Now, because this is the lowest ranked p-value, which is below this q-value threshold, we say that any test with p, uh, any uh, p-value that ranks higher than this 2,000 has suddenly passed the test, controlling at an FTR of 0.05. FDR of 0.05. And that's the hochberg benjamini principle. So what it says is if you have a lot, even if your top p-value isn't significant, if you have a lot of p-values that are uh, approaching significance, or you have a lot of like um, small p-values near the top, you can still get significance under a, a, a different test. Right. So this is so what the uh, what the guarantee is here is that of these 2,000 tests which we deem to show, uh, or these 2,000 different categories that we deem to show a significant enrichment, no more than five of them on, sorry, no more than 5%, which is uh, 100 on average, are going to be false positives. Okay, and often the FTR gives you many, many more significant categories or can give you significance <coughs> when you don't get any significant categories with the uh, family-wise error rate or the bone ferroni correction. Okay. Why? You'll see the FDR FDR use enormous numbers of pages. Because everyone always wants to start with five throwing and then they give up and they want to publish the FDR. Yeah. Brown Froney correction is what you use first. Because it's easy to do and um, it's a much more uh, stringent condition. But typically people end up uh, as why I said with the FDR. Okay, and then the uh, so when you do the one for only right? Yeah. Suppose only two particular genes pass that test and come out to be significant. It's not genes; it's categories. Categories come out to be significant. Your annotations, yeah. Annotations. Yeah. Does that mean that those really have passed your stringent test and they should be taken? You should be paying attention to that, or is it that when you go back to your FDR and get a bigger list, just go with the bigger list and don't you think about the FWER category? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Did you understand? I understand what you're saying. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but so things. You have said that this there's is a two, there, there's two conditions, yeah. Yes. So anything that passes FDR is also going to pass FWER. Okay. Right? That's always going to be true. Okay. The FDR is only going to give you. More things, right? Because the least stringent test, sorry, the most stringent test you do in the FDR yeah. is the bone Froni correction. So if you've done the bone Froni correction and you have things passing the bone Froni correction, they're also going to pass FDR at the same level of significance. Does that make sense? Okay. And also, also biologically, if you have additional information that is not considered in the test, that might help you, might help you make that decision. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think the biological significance would be probably one of the things you would look at very carefully. If you know a lot about the system, yeah. things that are coming up that you, were, you expect, for instance, um, those might be useful to identify. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. But then there's, I mean, I, I agree that you want to look at what things that pass your test and see whether or not they make sense. 
But there's one other thing that you have to be concerned about, especially if you're using uh, uh, gene ontology sets. As I, Gary pointed out, the gene ontology is a range a hierarchy. So there's more specific and less specific sets. So it means that there's a lot of overlap between the sets. This is what induces the positive correlation between their p-values. So sometimes you'll see a lot of categories coming up as being significant be simply because they contain the same set of genes. <coughs> right? So you'll get like RNA processing and ribosomal RNA processing, which is a subcategory of RNA processing. Yeah. Right? And so then after the fact, you have to go back and try to figure out what all these categories mean. And there's tools to do that. So Gary's going to talk about one of those tools that someone in his lab, uh, Daniel in his lab has developed. Uh, called the enri enrichment maps. And then the tool that we're going to see in our lab, there's a different way of doing that that sort of clusters the gene sets together. So, but this is, I, I think this is still an unsolved problem. If you have a lot of gene sets that pass significance and you have a lot of overlap in the genes in those gene sets, how you relate that information or how you understand the, what, what that test has told you ultimately. Okay, so that concludes multiple test corrections. Are there any more questions about that? No? Okay. So we are going to start our last lab, and we're going to attempt to do uh, a goal enrichment analysis on a gene list. But in order to do that enrichment analysis, you're probably going to have to do ID mapping from whatever uh, uh, whatever identifiers are used in your gene list to identifiers that are going to be recognized by the tool. So um, Gary's going to spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about uh, various ways of doing that ID mapping. And also, the tool that we're going to be using is Go Miner. Uh, sometimes requires you to put in a background set. So if you have, uh, if you uh, know the genes that are on your array, you might have that background set in hand. If you don't have that background set in hand, you can get that background set from Biomart. And so Gary is also going to show you how to use Biomart. Yeah. But that's problematic, right? Because not all genes, for example, are going to be expressed in that tissue. So that's going to erroneously. Uh, I mean, it depends on your analysis, yeah. So, I mean, are you looking for... So what I would do in that case is I would get the list of all genes that are expressed in that tissue, and then I would get the list of all genes that correspond that respond to your permutation. And the genes that respond to your permutation is your gene set, and your background is a set of genes that are expressed in that tissue. But with Biomart, I think you can actually filter for genes expressed in a given tissue. You may also have that from your experiment if you are um, analyzing a specific tissue. Um, you may, you know, that, that's hard. It's actually hard to figure out what's in a tissue because uh, not every method is very is as sensitive as you would expect. <laughs> so some of those levels being zero? <laughs> or very low. Okay. So um, oops. So uh, this is this is a continuation from this morning. I just wanted to spend um, five or ten minutes showing you the Synergizer and Biomart tool um, that I mentioned, uh, just because we didn't get a chance to do it this morning. And um, um, some of you I know I've seen already figured these tools out. They're very simple, so hopefully um, I, I'll only need to just quickly show you this. And then, um, let's see. <coughs> Um, so the idea for, for that sort of exercise, and you can do that later as part of this lab or whenever you have time, was to take a um, take a, a, a gene set, a gene set, convert it to 
um, which, which the one that, that's available on the wiki is a, a set of yeast genes. Um, and then those, those yeast genes are represented as gene names. Um, use Synergizer to convert the gene names to entree gene IDs, and then input the entree gene IDs into Biomars, uh, get the gene ontology annotation, um, and then um, look, at, look at the results to see how many times the uh, different gene ontology terms appear and, what, and how, how much of the evidence is different evidence codes. So that was sort of, the, and that's printed in your, in your book. Um, and that, that little exercise just gets you to try, the goal of that exercise is to get you to try out these, soft, these tools with this, a given gene list. If you have your own gene list, you don't really need to do it that way. You can use your own gene list. Um, but um, so let me let me um, find the yeast gene list that's on this computer. I'm just going to cut and paste it. Yeah. Oops. So I just noticed that um, this file that I, the, the yeast genes that you may download from the wiki, if you open it up in text editor, it's just all, all one line. Um, and that's just a, a, a Windows Macintosh formatting issue. So you can open, you can open it with uh, WordPad, and it should fix that problem. So now it's all, each gene is on one line. So, um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to um, copy all of these genes, um, which are, are yeast gene names. And I'm going to, I'm going to put them in Synergizer, wherever that went. OK, so Synergizer, um, the, the first thing you do is pick an authority. This is the uh, place, the source of the gene mappings, gene ID mappings. So remember, I talk, this is really just all about mapping different identifiers like affymetrics to entree gene or entree gene to uniprot. Um, and the one that uh, we typically use is Ensemble because Ensemble supports a lot of different species. So if we pick Ensemble, then we have a lot of different possible species that Ensemble supports. And um, you pick the species that, that you're interested in, in this case just for the purposes of this exercise, I'm picking yeast. And then you Pick the, it says from namespace and to namespace. From namespace is the ID identifier that you are, you're giving to Synergizer. And to namespace is the identifier that you want to get from Synergizer. And what, the nice thing I, I, the thing I like about Synergizer is that it shows you examples of the, of the identifiers here. Um, so it actually gives you examples. So one of the problems sometimes with these other tools is that they don't give you examples and there's 20 different ID types, but you don't know what the difference between Uniprot accession and Uniprot ID and Uniprot. There's like three different ones that are called Uniprot. Um, so this is uh, this is one of the reasons why I recommend this tool is because it's basically just easier to use for the simple reason that it gives you an example. So you can look at your you can look at your um, file. Um, where did it go? So in this case, I look at the file, this WordPad file, and I see, oh, everything sort of is of this format. All the genes look like they're YI, you know, YHR, and a number and a letter. So um, in Synergizer, I can pick the one that looks like that, which is one of these guys, Ensemble Gene ID, Peptide ID, or Transcript ID. So I'll just pick one, Ensemble Gene ID. And then I want to convert it to something else. Say I want to convert it to Entree Gene ID, which is a number. Um, but there's other ones here you can play with. Um, let's, let's pick Entree Gene ID. And then you just paste the files that, uh, the, the genes that you want to you wanna convert in this box. So just the authority again, what, what does the, what is the difference? Um, it's the source of where on, uh, Synergizer gets the mapping information. So some of these other authorities are related to specific organisms, like palm bases just for uh, yeast, Pombe yeast, and uh, Ecocyc is just for E. coli. Um, worm base is just for worms. Ensemble is a, a general all-around one. This Ensemble 49, Ensemble has 
different versions. Every few months they come out with a new version. And if you go to the Ensemble website, you can see what the, the current version is. I think it's at 54 or something. So I'm not going to pick 49 because for some reason it, it's in there, but it's probably older. So I'm just going to pick Ensemble. And hopefully this is the latest version of Ensemble, but it doesn't actually tell you that here. Um, uh, that's the, the question was sort of what, what is the authority? So that's the source. So um, anyway, so it's, it's pretty simple. You can, you can choose to output the results as a spreadsheet, in which case you get an Excel file back. It might be useful for you. And if you don't do that, when you submit, um, it just gives you a, um, it just gives you all of the uh, results here on the side. And you can, you can uh, copy and paste those into Excel, or it gives you the original ID that you gave and the entree gene ID. And it says that uh, IDs in red are not recognized um, by Ensemble and, and Yeast. So if you go down here, um, there's one thing that wasn't recognized here. So this one, this one wasn't recognized. It doesn't get an entree gene ID. But all the others actually get a nice entree gene ID. So that's, that's good. I think all of the others do. Oh, one, one, one doesn't get an ID. So that's a good, good example. Uh, sometimes you, you, it, recognizes, it recognizes the name. It's not red, but it doesn't know the ID. And so that's a case where that ID may not be, may not be an ensemble. Uh, sorry, may not be an entree. I keep on mixing up ensemble and entree gene ID. Um, that I, that I, the entree gene ID for that gene may not be an ensemble. Um, ensemble doesn't know about it. Maybe it is actually, there is actually an entree gene for that. And you could find it, perhaps, by searching an entree gene um, for that gene name. And so that's, that's what we were talking about before with the, um, um, you know, usually when you do this, the majority of, um, majority of, g of genes come back with nice one-to-one -one correspondence. You have a gene, and you have an entree gene ID. Um, but if you were able to put this into Excel and sort it, you would see the exceptions. So there's, one, there's some exceptions that are red. In which case, you may want to fix this gene name. Maybe it's a problem with your gene name. Maybe this gene name needs a dash or something in it. Um, some, some things where they're recognized, but, but you don't get anything back. So you can verify that there is, in fact, no G entree gene ID for that one by going to entree gene and searching for it. And I actually noticed one other exception here, which was um, there's multiple gene IDs for, for, this, for this gene. And I'm not sure what the reason is, but these are, this, is, this is sort of where the um, just investigating it more comes in. So if we if we actually put these different entree gene IDs into entree gene, you would see that and compare the different records, you'd be able to see why they're different. So entree gene is not supposed to be redundant. It's supposed to be non-redundant. So it's it would be surprising to me, and it would be a mistake in this in the da in entree gene database if there was really a redundancy. Um, but so let, let's actually just. The gene name is YCL067C. It may have been split. Um, so anyway, you can you can look. Oh, okay. This is a this is for yeast biologists. This is a known this is a known um, gene that's available that's present in multiple loci. So it's the mating factor gene that that skips around. So there's actually three different places for this gene. Um, the active site and the two different mating factors. So that's probably where entree gene is, has those different loci in different places. It makes sure Francis uh, can tell us more about that. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. So so that that's uh, that that that's an explanation for why that happens. It makes perfect biological sense. Um, and you can decide whether you need to correct for that or just choose one or the other. There's another example of two different Gene ensemble gene ID, which have got yeah. The, oh, the, you mean you mean an entree? Um, another some other examples where two genes come back? Uh, not only two genes, but two. So look at the seven quantum, the seven or nine something like that, right from the top there. Those YCR zero eight zero W and YBR one one eight W. Yeah, those two. Yeah. So these these also have two. It's a, this is this is the same problem. It's the same, same two numbers. Oh, it's the same two numbers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Again, you'd have to go look at these cases, and some of them may make biological sense, like the other one, and some of them may be mistakes in the database, which you could fix. Um, so this is it's as as repeating what I said before. 
typically you get 90% or 95% success. And then the, the extra little things, it pays to go and, and manually check them over just to make sure that, um, that you, uh, you, you're using the right identifier. As I said, using the wrong identifier will make, potentially make a serious error. OK, so that's, so that's Synergizer. Um, you can try it out with your own gene lists. Um, if you have, it, look, it, it supports um, plants and animals, uh, quite, quite a lot of different uh, species here, all the this, all this sequence genomes, basically. Um, actually, Arabidopsis is not, is not present in here, um, because I guess Ensemble is not um, currently using it. So yeah, maybe this isn't the best one for Arabidopsis. But for um, many other genomes, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I'll mention another, later we'll mention another uh, resource that's useful for Arabidopsis, and I just have to test if it recognizes, um, if it does gene ID mapping. It's the uh, botany uh, or bioarray resource bar at University of Toronto. Um, and the, li the link is on the wiki. For all the, the people who are working in plants, there's a, a wiki link about that. Anyway, so, so that's, that's um, uh, Synergizer. Um, I'm going to do... I'm going to click this one column view here, and I'm going to copy all of these entree gene IDs. Um, in general, something wrong is using another authority. So, for example, in CDI, I have RBW. Oh, okay, that's a good one. Yeah, so that's a good idea. I haven't tried and I haven't tried NCBI in this particular case, but yeah, good good uh, point. So yeah, so the, the point was that if you use another authority like NCBI, um, they have Arabidopsis here and a bunch of other organisms, so that's nice. It's worth pointing out that they, even if, even if you can use a different authority, oftentimes they won't have the same mappings. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So that's something I mentioned this morning that it's good to try. You may not get 100% coverage from one authority, and also there may be version issues. One authority is using an older version. So if you use different authorities um, and compare them, you might sort of identify some mistakes. So you can cross-compare mappings from different authorities and see if, they're, um, if one is better than the other, uh, or you can evaluate if one is better than the other, for instance, or if you should combine them both. OK. Next, I'm just going to, so you guys can play with that. Uh, next, I'm going to show you Ensemble Biomart. So Biomart, as I mentioned, is a sort of one-stop shop for a lot of different types of gene annotation data. And there's a lot of places where Biomarts exist, but the one that I like using is on, uh, that I think is particularly useful is on Ensemble. Um, so it's ensemble.org, E-N-S-E-M-B-L.org. And then when you go to the Ensemble site, um, you can, there's a link here that says mine Ensemble with Biomart. So Ensemble is a genome browser. You can browse around Ensemble if you're not familiar with it. Um, but if you click Mine Ensemble with Biomart, um, you get the Biomart screen popping up. And um, you can enter, as I showed you this morning, you can enter different types of, of data. How much time do I have, Quaid? Are you you're going to come back? And... Uh, the lab goes six. OK. Five. 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 So, um, the uh, okay, so I've I've reached Ensemble, and um, I'm just going to take you through this fairly quickly. But um, the key thing, it's very easy to use once you understand the sequence of events that you have to uh, follow. And that sequence of events, I find, is really not obvious for first-time users. So I'm just going to show you the sequence of events. I mentioned it in the in this morning as well. So. First, you, you choose a database. That's obvious, because you can't really do anything else. Um, it's at ensemble.org. And there's a link called Mine Ensemble with Biomart. It's right here. Does everybody see that? Anybody? But, there, but that's... That, it's a little bit different. And also, there's a lot of different biomarks. So um, you choose a database. There's a, there's a bunch of different databases here. Um, the one that has the most amount of information about genes is Ensemble. And 
it will have a number after it, which is the version of Ensemble, which increases every couple of months by one. Um, so I'm going to choose Ensemble 54. You could play with these other ones, but they're very different types of databases. And then um, it says choose a data set. And the data set is really, it should say choose an organism. Um, um, but this is, there's all the organisms that are supported by Ensemble. And um, again, uh, Arabidopsis isn't, isn't here, but um, I, I, Ensemble is currently expanding their um, system so that it has every genome that's complete genome, including bacteria, plants, um, and everything else. And it, I expect that that will eventually ma make its way into the system. I'm not sure when that's going to happen. Um, but uh, there may be a biomarch for plants. I don't know if, if uh, you guys know. <coughs> um, but uh, okay, so um, we I was uh, using yeast genes. So I'm going to select Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay, so we've selected Ensemble, and then we've selected um, uh, Yeast. And that's the easy part. The hard part is now knowing what to do. So on the side, you see data set. It says Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's good. It's from SGD. It's a particular version. And then it says filters, none selected, and attributes. And there's a couple of attributes. These are default attributes. You'll always get these back um, unless you change it. Um, but the idea is that, uh, as I mentioned this morning, you first define some filters. So the idea with Biomart is it starts out with the entire genome, and then you define some filters to, to narrow down your set of genes that you're interested in. So the filters can be, well, uh, there's lots of different types. In this particular case, I have Entree Gene IDs, and I want to um, just get more information about Entree Gene IDs. So I go to Gene which is a type of a filter, you know, it's related to gene, entree gene IDs. And I, there's an ID list limit thing, which I check. And then I can choose one of the, uh, one of one, an identifier to limit to. And entree gene ID is one of the standard ones that's in this list, so I can click that. And I can paste all of my um, entree gene IDs that I found um, before uh, in, this, in this box. So all of those entree gene IDs that I got from Synergizer, I just put in here. And now the next thing to do is to test that Biomart is actually working. And the way to do that is click count at the top here. This is a part that's not very really obvious. But if you click count, um, it basically tests that it recognizes uh, data. So it should say um, the data set is now 331 out of 7,124 genes. So Ensemble Biomart for Yeast understands 7,124 genes. And the, the genes that I gave it, um, you get um, it selected 331. And ideally, you would look in your original list, and you would just test. Um, if you knew that you had 500 genes, you'd expect to have some some number that's close to 500. Unfortunately, Ensemble Biomart doesn't really tell you easily right up right here which ones it doesn't recognize. It just tells you that it recognizes a certain number, so you have to kind of know the number that you expect. So that's it. You can filter other. Um, that's it for filtering. You can filter by other, other types of criteria which you can experiment with. Um, but the next step, the, the third step after selecting the data set and the filters, is clicking on attributes. And this is where you can select um, all sorts of information about these genes. This is the shopping, the shopping mall. The, this is the, the Biomart part, like the Walmart um, thing. So you just go shopping for different, different types of uh, information. So there's information from Ensemble, all of these things about you know, GC content of a gene, or the uh, source, or the status, or the strand. Um, there's also uh, a lot of external information, like gene ontology, um, Go IDs, Go evidence codes that I mentioned. Um, there's references to other other databases. You can get Affymetrics IDs. Um, so I'm going to select that. I can select protein domains. Maybe I'm interested to see the um, Interpro ID and the Interpro short description transmembrane domains, signal domains, lots of things. And that's just, in feature, that's just in this features thing. If you click structures or variations or sequence or homologs, you can get more information. Like you can download all the sequences of the genes or the DNA or specific exons or all sorts of different things. Um, so this is a really neat tool. When you're finished, you click up here on the top left on, on results. And um, it gives you a preview of what it will, what will, it will be giving you. And so 
we gave it um, some uh, IDs, and um, it gives you just the on on ensemble gene ID and the ensemble transcript ID. And this is the stuff that we asked for: um, Go IDs and Interpro. So this is this has a homeo domain like um, domain, and this is a homeo box domain. Um, it only shows you the top ten by default, but you can select to show all of them if you want. Um, you can you can show it as uh, comma separated values or tab separated values. This if you're having a problem with a lot of repeated elements here, which sometimes happens, you can click unique results only. But that's only if the entire row is the same as another entire row. Um, if there's any differences, it won't it will maintain it. Um, so one of the things I noticed here is that I don't have I gave it on entree gene IDs, but I don't have entree gene IDs in my results. So that's going to be a problem because when I want to map I I, I I want to match up my entree gene IDs to various different types of information. So I need to see that in the result. So I can go back to um, uh, good question. So the, uh, the question is why does go description not come up? And um, it's supposed to come up and we spoke to the, Francis spoke to someone who works upstairs who built Biomart and um, he he said that it's a problem with Ensemble. They just This particular version is missing the yeast Go description. I noticed that someone else was using uh, this for human, and the Go descriptions did come up for human. So it's just a bug in Ensemble for yeast in this particular query. And someone, hopefully, they're, they're, they'd be notified now so they, they can fix it for the next version. Sometimes I notice that happens with Ensemble. Because Ensemble is a, is a, um, a lot of the data comes from a large computational pipeline, which takes weeks to run, and occasionally things break in there and they don't notice. It's such a huge system. and um, But usually it's fixed in the next version. The other thing, if there's some particular piece of information that you really need and it's not there, you can go back to any previous version of Ensemble from the Ensemble homepage, and there'll be a Biomart that works on that previous version, and you should be able to get the information. You maintain all their old versions. So I, I was saying I, we need to see the entree gene IDs here to make a, the, map, the connection between the gene IDs and the the evidence. So I'm going to go back to the attributes and I'm going to select um, under external um, entree gene ID here. Entree gene ID. And uh, every time I select a checkbox here, it sort of comes up here. So this is the, the list of things that I, that I want. So now I'm going to go back to results. And now the entree gene is here. So that's great. Now I can match up what I gave for my original data to these other other things. Um, and now I'm happy. This sort of just showed me the first 10 results just as a check to make sure that it's working. Um, and now I can save the uh, results to a file in different formats. One of them is Excel. One of them is tab HTML. One of them is tab separated values. If I click HTML and I click Go, then I just get a web page with all of the information. Um, Oh, it looks like it, it gave me a text file. Oh, cancel. That's what, that's because I, I asked for file. Oh, no. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I guess it's an HTML file that you can open up. Um, if you want to see it on the web, I guess you have to click here and click all. And then it goes to a, another web page, and it will show you, it will show you <laughs> all of the information. And, the nice thing about viewing it on the web is that you can click on these things, and if you click on any of these these links, um, it will it will find you will find more information about that. So this links to Interpro tells you more about the HomeoBox domain, um, including nice pictures and other things like that. So this is a kind of a nice jumping off point for information about your gene list. If you give it a set of genes, you can ask for information back. And you can make a custom web page that you can click and get more information about all the all the things. So it's really nice for just looking looking through long lists of genes um, with only the things that you're interested in seeing. And you can also save things to Excel, which is useful for follow-up work in Cytoscape or other places, GSEA. Any questions? So fairly simple and try it out. Uh, over the, the lab. So I'm going to pass it back to Quaid for.
Okay, uh, I guess we're only up to 5 o'clock. I read 16.30 is 6.30. <laughs> Just something I tease my wife about all the time. So no one's going to tell her that I screwed that up, too. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we're going to use GoMiner now. Uh, GoMiner is a nice, easy tool to use. Um, you can also do Go Enrichment Analysis from within Cytoscape, but GoMiner, uh, for me, is... Uh, is uh, very straightforward, so that's what we're going to uh, that's going to use. And the nice thing about Gold Miner compared to um, compared to FunSpec is it does handle other organisms, and um, it allows you to to some extent to filter by Go annotation code. So, hmm. All right. I thought I baked up one for you, but I <coughs> probably closed it. So, the way that I always find these things is I go to Google and I say Gold Miner. That's how I find Biomart too. So if you're worried about finding Biomart and you can't remember how Gary told you how to do it, I just put go Biomart here, and look, there's Biomart. And I got to choose Ensemble, and there we go. Now I'm in Biomart. So that was pretty easy. So Go Miner. Okay. So here's Go Miner. So Go Miner actually has uh, is a standalone application, but uh, I just use the high throughput setting because I like using things on the web, and, uh, and then I just go to the web interface. Okay. All right. So, GoMiner, like all these other things, it has to do uh, three things, three main things for you. The first thing it's got to do is it's got to be able to match up what it calls the change set, and that's your gene list with the background list. If you use different identifiers, GoMiner is going to get confused. And I'm going to show you how it gets confused in a second, but we're going to do the easy thing first. And then the other thing that GoMiner has to do is GoMiner has to be able to match up your your background list and your change set list with Go annotations. Okay, and so if Go Miner fails, one of those uh, one of those three things it's failed to do, and it's going to complain to you when it fails. But uh, we're going to try to make it fail. But first, we're going to make it succeed. Okay, so step one, this is they call it the total file here. Uh, I don't know why they just don't use background, but the nice thing is is you can actually ask it to auto generate. So we're just going to do that for the time being. We're going to ask it to auto-generate our background set. But if you have a specific background set, you're going to have to upload it using that browse box. Um, and uh, the pointer went away. I probably took it to my seat. So I'm going to use this thing instead. OK. So your gene list, you actually put it in set, uh, step two. So step two, select the change file. So for the gene list, I'm going to use that module one uh, yeast gene list that uh, Gary's been using. Uh, and these are the genes that are involved in GAL4. Okay, and that's uh, on my desktop. And so let me, uh, I'm going to upload it right now, but I'm also going to go back to the desktop to show you what it looks like. It's actually pretty easy. It's just, uh, it's just a list exactly like that, right? So one gene identifier per line, that's all you have to do. Okay, and we're going to kind of hope for the best with uh, Go Miner, the Go Miner will be able to recognize everything. So now, the step three is we have to select the data source. And what that means is this is where Go Miner is getting their Go annotations from. And so there's only one data source that provides Go annotations for yeast, and that's SGD, which is the model organism database. Some of these uh, organisms, here's plant right there. Uh, so we're good, we're covering plant. Some of the, some organisms like uh, Homo sapiens, human, have multiple data sources that you can get uh, annotations from. In that case, you have to put in the gene, uh, the identifier for the data source in a um, in a semicolon separated list here. Uh, I've never actually tried that, uh, but it looks kind of hard. Um, but I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, but you know, SGD that's pretty easy. Okay, and now you have to select the organism. So uh, that would be yeast. Okay, and this is where we get to select the, the evidence code. So we get to choose the evidence level from the list. So we don't have arbitrary selection here. Um, we only have, uh, we, they've ranked the evidence codes in terms of um, how uh, suspicious they think they are. So the, the most suspicious evidence code is the IEA. So you can only select all. If you select all, you get the IEA. And then, then GoMiner feels the RCA evidence code is the next most suspicious. So you can get rid of that, and then it feels that the NAS is the next most suspicious. But down here, you can also 
do a, a, a semicolon separated list of, uh, list of Go Evidence Codes if you don't like their, uh, their ranking. Uh, I'm pretty happy with Evidence Level 2. So uh, IEA, as you know, these are ones that are totally electronic. RCA, these are ones that are, uh, these are annotations that are, have been um, um, imputed by computational methods, but someone's published them. So in, in that sense, someone has looked at the publication and uploaded the, uh, I don't fully trust those, even though I'm in the business of, uh, of uh, predicted G function. <laughs> okay, because those are my competitors. Uh, uh, and uh, if you take enhanced, you got to take enhanced names off, because that's, if you choose Uniprot, as the as the source, um, uh, you need the enhanced names, but we're not choosing Uniprop. Okay, and then you can choose uh, just nominal p-value or FDR. We're going to take both as a constraint, and then so here's so remember you always have to do this multiple test correction. So when you do this multiple test correction, you can lose significance if you do too many tests. Now, one way to ensure that you're able to detect some statistical signal is to reduce the number of tests that you do. So you can't look at your data before you decide which tests you're going to uh, throw away. But there are, you can throw away tests based on whether or not you think they're going to have sufficient power to, to give you a significant result. And, the t and so but gene sets that are too small, you're never going to get sufficient statistical power. So what GoMiner allows you to do is allows you to set a threshold on the largest uh, on the smallest gene set that you can consider. So it puts that threshold at five, which is kind of decent. Like we throw away anything that's five or less. Actually, we throw away anything that's ten or less. And what that essentially means is you're doing so many tests that um, you're never going to get sufficient statistical power in a small category. So you might as well never even just do that. Just never do that test in the first place. Okay, so. And by restricting the number of tests you do, you restrict the, what you have to divide by in the bond for any correction. OK. And uh, the CIM thing I'm going to show you after we've, done, uh, after we've done the analysis. This is one of these ways to deal with the fact that many of the gene sets you're going to be looking at contain the same genes over and over again. OK. And then we're just going to look at the biological process. But you can choose all the categories if you want. Let's go crazy. No, I'm going to choose biological process because I don't want to go off the script. And so this, this analysis actually takes a few minutes. So I'm just going to put in my email address. And I'm going to submit the query. OK? And if you're successful, GoMiner will tell you that, you, that, you, that you're going to be emailed. And so while we're waiting for this to happen, I'm going to try to be unsuccessful, OK? To see what it looks like so you don't get upset um, if uh, something weird happens. OK, and the, uh, the way that I'm going to be unsuccessful uh, is I'm going to use an unsuitable background set. All right. uh, so to get this unsuitable background set, I'm going to go to Biomart. And I always find Biomart by putting it into Google and then going to Biomart and then choosing Ensemble. OK. And as Gary said, you got to choose the ensemble database. And remember, we're using yeast. So we got to go down and find Saccharomyces. OK. And the, like the, the major thing I use when I use ensembles, I use actually ensemble to get a list of all the genes in the genome. Tend to, uh, well, that's one of the things I use Biomart for. But for the filters, we're going to be a little bit more um, specific. So we're going to limit, uh, how do I do this again? Yeah, we're going to limit to genes that have Go IDs, right? So I don't know if any of you are yeast biologists, but 7,000 genes seems like a lot of genes for yeast. Um, and that's because they're including like uh, RNA, not non-protein coding genes. So what we're going to do when we establish our background set, I'm just going to limit to ones that have Go IDs. So these are ones that actually have been annotated. OK, and then I'm going to go to attributes. And I just want a, a single list, so I can actually take some of these features off. OK, and then um, uh, then I'm going to go to results and see to make sure that I got the thing that I need. Now, this is actually, oh, this is perfect, actually. These are what I need. So uh, these are the uh, systematic names for yeast. Oh, no, 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 no. OK. Actually, to, I have to screw up. I have to uh, make a greater effort. So instead of using the systematic names for yeast, I'm going to use the common names of the gene symbols for yeast. So I chose uh, SGD ID. It took me a while to figure out which one that was. 
but the way that I do that is I, I always go to um, I always go to results to get a get a, a preview of what I'm doing. And now I'm gonna for some reason you have to click unique results only because sometimes you get uh, the same row over and over again. And then I'm gonna ask uh, Bomart to give me a text file. Okay, so let's open up a Notepad. And, oh, it looks awful. Uh, but you know what we're going to do? We're just going to save and hope for the best. Okay. Yeah, so what's happened is um, Notepad doesn't read new line characters from different systems appropriately. So you get everything on the same line. Okay, but now I have saved that file, which I believe to be an inappropriate thing for uh, GoMiner to use. And I'm going to try to make GoMiner fail. Why is it inappropriate if selected this in this annotation with raw annotation what is the wrong ID? This is the wrong ID. So exactly. so the, the, the list that I put in has systematic names and the background list has common names. And I managed to get GoMiner to fail going to uh, doing it the other way, so I'm gonna try to get GoMiner to fail using this way. Okay, and so let's go to recent places. Uh, okay. Instructor, oh, documents, here we go. Instructor documents downloads. All right. Uh, download somewhere that I don't know where it is. So I'm going to go back and get Baumark to send it to me again. And I'm going to open up in WordPad. Okay, well, I'm going to do this now for the best. That is not <laughs> going to work. But Mart Export is going to tell me where it is. What's on the desktop? Okay. Okay, go minor. Okay, um, while we're waiting for this to happen, I am going to check my email to see whether or not I've got the file yet. <coughs> nope. Okay. Has everybody else sent their thing to uh, Go Miner? Okay, so uh, it's going to take a little while then. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could do the biomass thing that you were doing a little slower, we can further it a little more. Okay. So just the logic. Uh, where do you want me to start? Okay. Search for biomart on. Right, like that. Ensemble. Ensemble. Ensemble just take one more. Yeah. Choose data set. Choose data set as ensemble. And the data set, that's just the organism name. Yeah. Okay. So filters. So if I don't filter, I get 7,000 genes in yeast. And that includes uh, non protein coding genes. So I don't really want those in my background set. So I'm going to filter for, uh, I could filter for things that are protein coding, and, and you can actually do that here, I believe. No, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Gene type. You can filter by gene type so that you only take the protein coding genes. Do you see that? And then I'm going to press count to see how many protein coding genes Ensemble thinks are on the yeast genome. Okay, and Ensemble thinks there's 6,600. But then I can filter it even more by limiting to genes that have Go IDs. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. okay, now I'm limiting genes that have Go IDs. I press count again to see my, how many I've got. And I've now I've got 5,900, which seems a bit, you know, seems kind of reasonable to me. So I know there's like around 6,000 genes in yeast, protein coding genes. So, so for this we're we're currently filtering the background. Yeah. So 
I, well, this is just to establish the background. Now, if you are, if you have some other reason, so, so there's other ways to do the filtering. So what I can show you afterwards, or I can show individual people, is you can filter, if you choose human, you can filter for expression in certain tissues, for example. Right. So, but it's worth your while to, uh, to look around at all the different filters you can use. So here you can actually filter by chromosome. You can filter by chromosome and region by putting in the chromosome coordinates. I mean, uh, Baumart is uh, on ensemble is really powerful. I always the first thing I do is I go and look at Baumart to see if it can solve my problem. You can filter by protein domains, which is pretty cool. Look at this. You can filter by whether or not they have a uh, transmembrane domain, and what you can filter by depends upon the species that you choose as well. Okay, but we're, we're just going to filter by Go ID. So this is, seems like a reasonable background. Okay, but then we have to change the attributes because I want to have a file at the end of the day that I'm going to be able to upload into Go Miner. So I choose the attributes, and by default, uh, Biomart applied to Ensemble gives Ensemble Gene ID and Transcript ID, which in this case is actually helpful to me. Sometimes the ensemble gene ID is not what you want because it's E, N, S, G, blah, 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 blah. And uh, ensemble likes that, but not very many other people do. Um, so you have to, uh, you have to uh, go around looking for the gene symbol. So I'll show you how to get the gene symbol for yeast. Usually the gene symbol that you want is an external. And in this case, they're calling it the SGD uh, G ID. So I've just opened up external and I've chosen the SGD ID. And then the way that I actually figured out that SGD ID was the thing that I wanted is I looked at results and it gives me a little preview, right? And these uh, these things look about right. These are clearly gene names here. And if you're not sure about that, you can just make it bigger, right? And then you've got like more examples to look at. And yeah, these are gene names. The ones that still are systematic are these are genes that haven't been as, uh, assigned a name yet. That's How what. You make it oh, uh, yeah. Let me go up to the top. In the view, you can oh, choose the number of rows that you see. Yeah. So ten is mostly. Usually, I just use that because uh, because that gives me like a, a sample of of what I've actually uh, chosen. <laughs> so, but now that I've got what I need, I can get it to give me a file. And like I said, you have to choose unique results only because sometimes you get duplicated results. And I'm not sure why that happens. Probably some database lookup thing, but there you go. Okay, so now I've chosen re unique results only. Press go. Okay. So uh, I'm going to try saving this file and then looking for it. This was my laptop, it would be easy. But since I don't know Vista really well, I'm going to try. OK, so I've just saved the file that, uh, that I've gotten back. OK, so let's try Mart export. OK, good. Now, where do you live? All right. That's what I want. OK. I'm actually going to have to open this file up in WordPad. Where was it? Uh, I didn't find it. Does anybody know Vista better than I do? You can tell me. What was the name of the file? The, ma the file is always called martexport.txt. I did search. I did do search, but I'm looking for the location. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Hopefully, this is the right Mart export. Uh, what's the latest date? There, I'll use this Mart export instead. 
Okay, now I'm going to dump it somewhere I can find it again. So I'm going to dump it into documents. Okay, now we're going to go back and we're going to make or attempt to make Go Miner fail. Has anybody got the results from Go Miner yet? Yeah. Okay, let me. Looks like I got mine too. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to browse the results. Okay. So all we have here is just a summary of the, the tests that we did. These are the genes that we uploaded. Right? That fire's pile should be familiar. These are the parameters that we used. And this is the database version that we used. And this is important because the, uh, the Go annotations get updated all the time. So it's a good thing to report. OK, and you can download the whole thing, or you can browse your results uh, in HTML. So you can download this thing to your, um, to your computer, and then you can do HTML bro uh, browsing locally. But I'm just going to do it here. OK, and so I want to look at the results for each of the changed files. So that brings me here. OK, so the first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at the gene category summary. OK, so. What we have here, I wish I had my, uh, my pointer. But at the very top, these are currently sorted by uh, p-value. And here are the reporting p-value is logged to the base 10 p-value. So this would be something times uh, 10 to the minus 10, because this is minus 9, uh, not minus 9.58. OK, enrichment here is just fold enrichment. And so this is the total number of genes in this category, which is 200 and uh, I think this is log fold enrichment, is 209. And the number of changed genes in this category, which is carbohydrate metabolic process, was 39. Right? Oh, wonderful. Good. Let's see if I can lose this one, too. OK. And so here we are. Right? And then that's the log to base 10 p-value. And here's the false discovery rate. And the false discovery rate is effectively 0. OK. Now, this, this file is, uh, is from a GAL4 sc uh, screen, so we shouldn't be surprised that we get carbohydrate metabolic process coming up here, and cellular carbohydrate metabolic process. And now if you click through, these are actually probably related to each other. All right, so this is the description of it. <coughs> Okay, so this is uh, this is where it sits in the goal a hierarchy. In cellular carbohydrate me metabolic process, as we thought, is actually a child of carbohydrate metabolic process, which means that carbohydrate metabolic process contains all the genes that are in cellular carbohydrate metabolic process. So now, again, here's a list of all the uh, all the categories. We can actually download that as an Excel file, which is useful. Um, but then we can also look at this sort of cluster analysis. So what's happening in the cluster analysis, this is a, um, I guess this is a two-way hierarchical cluster of the matrix, the annotation matrix. So what I mean by that is along the x-axis are, are all the different categories, the goal categories that there's uh, significant enrichment for. And along the y-axis are uh, the, the various genes that participate in those categories. And you see a red, uh, and a red element here indicates that that gene is annotated in the specific category. So you can see that there's these blocks. And what these blocks indicate is that there's a set of categories that all contain that same, same gene set. And there's a set of genes that um, uh, are all in the same set of categories. So we actually have these massive blocks. So let's look up here. This is a good block to look at. So it just reflect redundancy in the goal. It reflects redundancy in the Go annotation, right? So the the, uh, the first and the third ranked sets were categories that are actually hierarchically related to each other, right? So when you start reporting these things, you're going to report a whole bunch of things that basically say this gene is involved in ca carbohydrate metabolic processing, right? So. If you don't mind, one more time, how did you get to this screen from the original category summary report? Uh, okay. right here. I went through here. Okay. Okay, now 
Let's try to get Go Miner to fail. So I've used the same change set, which was our original gene list, but in the, I put in a background set that used G, different gene identifiers. There we go. Okay. So here the problem is, is that it couldn't match this in the uh, It couldn't match this gene name that was in the change set within my gene list with the, with the set of total genes. It's not, smart enough to go and fix it it's not smart enough to go and fix it by yourself, so you have to fix it for it. Okay, But that's what, that's what happens when you see this screen. Right? And it just means that you have to get your change set and your background set in line. Okay, so there's Go Miner. It's a very... Background file or is it well, no, because in that case, your background file might not be appropriate. Well, so we can have a look at that. And what is the appropriate background file? Is it the, the genes in the, in the, in the microarray chip? Is it the genes in the cell? Is it the genes in the tissue? The, the appropriate background file, so you have a set of genes that are in your gene set, right? And the background file is the set of genes from which that gene set is chosen. Right, so if you have a microarray that only has like genes that are expressed in the brain on it, there's no way that you could pull a gene set from that microarray that contained genes that weren't expressed in the brain. Yeah, that's true, but, but my, my, let's say my cell sample came from the brain, right? So, so even if the epigenetics contain all of the genes, maybe it's more appropriate to have a list of the genes that are expressed in the brain, or is it? All of the human beings is a background. Again, it, uh, for me, it depends what your test is. Right? But I w at the first thing I would do is I would just use everything as your background set. So it depends on your test. So sometimes you want to look at yourself and have those But if you're, it's possible for you to pull up any gene of genome Okay, and there's one other error that I wanted to point out here, right at the bottom. So in the, Mart, at the export that I got from Biomart, it has a, a header line that says SGDID. Right, now if I, was able, uh, if I opened it up, let me see if I could show that to you. Oh. Uh, you're going to just trust me on that. Um, and GoMiner doesn't like that. So what you're going to what you have to do if you were actually using this as a background set, you have to open that up in WordPad and take out the top, uh, the header line. You can also probably open it up in Excel. Let me see if I can find that. Yeah, so here is, uh, here's the header line. So Notepad has actually thrown away all this stuff. But the thing that came back to me from Mart, uh, Biomart actually had a header line that said SGDID. And GoMiner is a little bit sensitive to that sort of thing. So you would have to edit that out in WordPad. I think you could, you could also do it in Excel. So let me see if I can open this thing up in Excel. I'll save. Yeah. 
failure. Oh, there's a WordPad. All right. Okay. Okay, and now I'm just going to take a subset of these as my change set to show you that yeah, I decided against doing that because we only have 50 minutes left. So, um, With the remaining 15 minutes, and likely later tonight, why don't you try doing the same thing with the gene sets that you brought? All right, and we'll be around to help you with that. So, uh, the things that you have to be able to do is your background set, you can either let Go Miner choose your background set, which I think is a good thing to start with, and Go Miner has to be able to match up your gene identifiers to the identifiers used in the annotations. All right, so, the thing that I would try first is just take your listed, uh, just take your gene set, your initial gene set, and upload them to Go Miner and choose the appropriate organisms. 